Good morning. Junior officers have been talking about the article, We Hear You, by Lieutenant General Milford Beagle and other Army officers. I am Dr. Blanding, and today we'll discuss this article in order to get a better understanding of the author's intent. To better understand their point of view, we'll talk with Lieutenant General Beagle, Commanding General Combined Arms Center, Fort Leavenworth, Lieutenant Colonel Soka, Major Harris, and Captain Robichaud. Before we start, please tell me a little bit about yourselves, starting with Lieutenant General Beagle. Yeah, so Dr. Blanding, one, thank you for having the team in. I feel a little bit guilty bring, bringing the entire team in with me. I said I could, I could take this one for myself, but it was a, a team effort. But just really quickly about me, born and raised in South Carolina. I've been serving for 33 years. I've got two, two boys, two great boys. Oldest is a, is a captain in the Army. And so, again, we talk a lot about some of these issues because he's married with the family as PCS multiple times at this point. Uh, one daughter-in-law, granddaughter. Uh, we have a dog. Most people think with a name like Beagle, you have a Beagle as a pet. We don't. We have a Chihuahua. <laughs> and, and she's awesome too, has her own personality, and been in the seat about six months. And my last three jobs have been all CG and senior command jobs. And, and this is the third of you know, those jobs or turns you know, in command. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mike Soika. Uh, I have been in uh, just over 20 years now, just came out of battalion command in the wonderful 177 armor uh, down in 1st Armored Division. Uh, married, have Two wonderful boys. Uh, my oldest is a junior in high school right now, so going through all the, the fun of, of getting ready to get him off to college. Um, I am next slated to go to a, uh, a fellowship here at SAMS uh, for ASLSP for Senior Service College. I'm excited about the opportunity, uh, and I've had the opportunity. Uh, I'm an armor officer, I'm passionate about it, and I, I've had the opportunity to command in both armor and infantry formations. What are your thoughts about battalion command? It was awesome. Uh, and I think it was awesome because of, of the people. I had a phenomenal team. I had a great group of company commanders. Uh, nothing was ever perfect, but it was an opportunity for me to, to do things the way I'd always hoped I would be able to do it. Uh, and I got to build a great culture. And I think that's probably the most important thing that came out of, of my time there was really getting to demonstrate what it feels like when you have the right culture in a unit. Major Harris? Morning, I'm Major Lashardo Harris. I'm a force management officer by way of an adjutant general. Been in the military about 19 years now today, serving as General Beagle's military assistant. I'm held from Colleen, Texas, military brat, single, no kids, got a lot of nieces and nephews though that I consider my kids. And just background, career, um, about seven or nine duty stations. And I enjoy traveling and you know the working. So kind of a lifelong learner. She didn't mention she's she's getting her working on her PhD too and, do, oh, and doing quite yes. well. Oh. So on top of the job she's had that I hired her into, and then the job I hired her into, and then to continue to do your PhD. And oh, by the way, being an honor student in the in the you know doctrinal program is like phenomenal. I mean, it mm -hmm. proves a lot of things can be done on top of what you do day to day. Yes, sir. Yes. What do you want to research? So, yeah. sir, my current topic is effective strategies to increase employee engagement. So kind of a more of an HR niche, but more about considering the employee's voice to uh, strategic management. So I'm assuming qualitative. Yes, sir. Good. Oh. Sir, good morning. I'm uh, Captain Sean Robichaud. I'm a logistics officer from uh, Kipsey, New York, coming up on 14 years uh, in the Army. Uh, last couple of jobs I've had, so I was at Fort Drum. Uh, I had the privilege to command a company in Afghanistan for 10 out of 16 months of my time in command. Uh, and then I was a battalion S3 for a BSB. Um, and of the last 24 months, 18 months has been spent as a General Beagle's aide. Was command challenging for you? It, it was not. Uh, I would say the most challenging aspect of command was figuring out COVID. So, you know, I, I deployed to Afghanistan in February of 2020. And, you know, the COVID crisis kicked off in, in March of 2020. So month after I got there and, and you know, some of the fobs we were on in Afghanistan, we didn't even know COVID existed. Like it, it just wasn't there yet. Um, so reintegrating back into that and dealing with that in the latter half of the deployment was probably the most challenging thing I had to deal with. Sir, why did you feel the need to write this article? Yeah, well, we had, I know we've got about an hour to deal with since so I'll try to give you the, the quick context. And the, the need struck me, you know, many, many weeks ago 
when there was a series of articles that, that kept coming in, just in one particular week, and one was handed to me by another senior leader, and it was the first article about the captain that didn't, you know, had commanded, somewhat enjoyed it, but decided didn't, he didn't want to command a battalion. Right after that was another article, and that was, that was an article related to recruiting, and then it was a chaplain, from a chaplain's perspective about recruiting. Then there was another article about you know, a captain that had just gone through the career course, in my career course, and wasn't really satisfied with, with his experience. And to myself, I'm like, what is going on with, with these articles? And knowing you know, what it takes, the personal courage it takes to do an article. One, you're, you're laying out your logic, you're laying out your assumptions, your thoughts, and you're putting it out there. So you're, you're making yourself very vulnerable. And, and most people don't do that. And that's something I appreciate. And I said, you know, one, a senior leader handed me that article, and said, they take a look at this. And typically that's what we do. We, we talk about it amongst ourselves, and we don't talk out loud. But then thinking about those individuals the, the urge in me and, and I pulled the team and I, you know, ran my initial ideas, you know, across this team because, you know, very similar experiences in terms of command, perspective, moves, I mean, you name it. And then you look at the, the, the age disparity of our group, you look at the diversity of our, this, this team right here, and you go from captain to lieutenant general, I'm like, okay, we, we probably have some answers to, to some of these articles. And I said, one, I was adamant about the title. I think there wasn't a lot of debate. Mike Sorka served as Mike's show and I said, we just got to tell it we hear you. So if there was you know, one mistake, I'd probably say maybe the mistake based on the feedback. But, but that was part of it. Because, again, if you write these articles, you make yourself vulnerable, you put your thoughts and ideas out there, you don't really hear anything back. And I'm o- only assuming the conversations are going to happen with your peer group, some that know you, and that's kind of it, where you really need that conversation to go much bigger. So it was the point of, yeah, we, we hear your argument, hear where you're coming from. And that was what got the title, what got us on the road of the article, and then getting you know, buy-in from the team here. Because I didn't want to force them into it, and that was one of my first things. I'm, I don't want to pull you into it. I'll, I'll go this road on my own. But it was the perspective of the rank diversity of our team that said, let's, let's see if we can tackle this and get our arms around it. Did you write the majority of this article, sir? No, actually, to be honest, Mike wrote a majority of it. But And you always have a lead writer. I think if we'd have took parts and pieces of it to write together, it probably wouldn't have you know, nest, nested well or, or stitched together well. So I think I laid out a lot of blueprint things and thoughts and ideas and framing for Mike. Mike took it from there with, between Sean and Cherto. They had their cuts at it. So a lot of back and forth for about maybe a couple of weeks, sure. you know, doing this. And then me reading it, you know, editing, going back and forth, you know, with Mike and the team, and then finally get to the point of production. Given the feedback, response, and conversation this article generated, is there anything you feel was misunderstood? I would say the title, because a lot of folks were like, you didn't hear us, you, you heard us, but you, you know, said go be quiet, which was not the point. I think the only, only other thing that was misunderstood is we were trying to tackle three different perspectives in one article. So again, probably a you know, mistake from, from the jump, trying to combine it, but I wanted to do something quick and come back quick. And it wasn't as a rebuttal or a reclama you know, to that article, but to get something out there quick to get us to the point we're at now, this conversation. But I think there, there are many things in there misinterpreted in terms of perspective, because look at the perspectives you're talking about. I, I command at three companies. And so when somebody says to me, you know, command is not something I enjoy, I did three companies back to back to back. So as a captain, if somebody would, and I say it to young audiences today, if somebody would have offered me a fourth, I would have jumped right on it. But I had peers then that command just wasn't their thing and something they didn't want to you know, continue to do. What toll did that put on your family, sir, commanding four companies back to back? And what recommendations would you give to this young generation? Yeah, I would, for me, and again, a lot of, a lot of our thoughts, I think you would hear today, are personal, right? Yes, and, and, and some of it is professional. But I would say no toll in the sense of, you know, I went through what everybody typically is going to go through, you know, in command, regardless of what level. You're going to have times where you're away from family. Yes, sir. You're going to have times where you're long hours. You're going to have time where, you know, you're, you're spending a lot of time dedicated to that organization. On the phone, you're at a soccer game, football game, whatever, and you got to take a call. You got to take a call because it's an emergency. Yes, and sir. so we went through all that. But the thing I was able to achieve, and I don't, I don't call it balance, but in terms of harmony with my family, the focus is work and it was a family. Because you only have a finite amount of time to, to deal with, you know, day to day. And so given, you know, a majority of that time to an organization, what is left, every bit of what's left goes to the family. And then that kept us, you know, pretty cohesive and, and pretty well integrated as a family throughout throughout that time. Because my kids then, one was was just born in my second command, 
The other was, you know, about four years old in my second command. And by the time I got to the third, then you're, you know, one was at the age of, you know, three and then I think six, you know, between the two. But even with that, keeping them integrated, when I would go into work, if I had to go in for something on a weekend or just time where I could take them, you know, that time was spent with me. We go to the office, they do their thing, run around, you know, see. But it was a very short amount of time. And then we right. would spend the rest of that time, you know, together. Sir, is there anything that was taken out of context? I think what was taken out of context is, or a little bit out of context and missed, is most people were expecting to address a lot of issues, you know, from a policy perspective. And again, I'm not the chief of staff of the Army. Right? Yes, we we do a lot here. I'm you know in control of a lot of things. Dot mil PFP, yes, particularly the D, the O, the T, and the L, but not the not the last P, not the policy P. So from a perspective of yeah, we didn't address you know policy issues. We didn't address hey, what is the Army doing? I learned something you know very early in life is like you speak from your point of expertise in the job you're in. So I'm not speaking for the chief. I'm not speaking for the Army. And one yes, thing that that we did do that I did. Prior to publishing that, we send it to the Secretary of the Army's office, send it to General uh, Brito at TRADOC and a couple of other senior leaders to say, when this article comes out, we're not trying to speak for the Army and just make sure that we're within left and right. And it's more so, you know, me, if I'm in left and right limits, then my team is in the left and right limits. So we, we did those, you know, checks before even publishing the article. Yes, sir. Is there any clarification you would like to add to the article? I think as we go through a lot of the questions, and I know we got a ton of questions, yes, sir. and I want the team to, to chime in as well, I think that's going to give us clarification as you hear some of their answers, because if we're able to talk to the many people that provided feedback on all of our social media platforms and emails <laughs> and, and everything else, then there was a point of clarification, because now you can communicate. And the, the thing that I think bothers me the most is when you get that feedback, the, the level of anonymity gets you one thing, because a lot of people will give you feedback, tons of it. But I don't know who you are. And, and so not that I really need to know that, but if we could talk, have those conversations, one, have the courage to have it. I mean, yes, I love, would love walking through the hallways and somebody say, hey, sir, can you clarify what you've been on this? I can do it at PCC, pre-command courses, even with some of the general officer courses, because they'll bring it up and we'll talk about it. But you, you've got to have that courage to do it, to understand you know, both sides of it. And that was the key thing we were trying to portray, you know, is both sides of it. I think reframing stuck a lot of people the wrong way because we said yes. reframe. And, but a, a simple way of saying that is it's the other side of the coin. I mean, from somebody that you know, enjoyed command and, and everything that's come along with a military career, here's the other side of it. Here's how I saw it, right? Understand how you see it. And for me, being where I am 33 years in, you're, you're, you're far removed in some things you can't really get your arms around because you've been doing it for so long. I mean, you go to Captain Robichaud, a little bit closer to it. And, and the team here always gives me a little bit different perspective, like, oh, Never really considered that because you didn't have to. Yes, and, and really, it was part of relaying that that I think people you know, took out of context in terms of reframe. And they interpreted it as like, no, you're, you know, you're, you're not hearing us, and you're just essentially saying, shut up and call it. That's not the case. Were you surprised by some of the feedback, sir? Honestly, not really. Be because of you know, talking to the team here and understanding the, the multitude of perspectives that are going to be out there, some of it wasn't surprising. Some of it... I wouldn't even say hurtful. It, it was somewhat laughable. I mean, when somebody says, you're just old, you don't get it. Okay. You know, you get that kind of feedback. Well, you're, you're not really trying to have a true intellectual debate at that point, if that's, you know, kind of what you're going to throw. And some of the other points were, were really good, but it's, it's the feedback you want. You can't, you know, get emotional about feedback when you get it. What did you learn from the responses that you were share with other Army senior officers? To, to listen. The, and one, you, you've got to listen because in that feedback, good, bad, or indifferent are going to be the answers or a lot of solutions. And that's what, if, if like when I glean through all of that feedback from multiple sources, you, you can see the answers. One, one Marine lieutenant colonel sent me an email. Well, he sent me a direct message. Then he sent me an email because he was work, he's working on his PhD. And he said, sir, I, I've got an article. I think you should take a look at it. And he sent me the article. Somebody had already put that article on my Twitter, and you know I, I didn't read it at that point because I was going through all the other feedback. But later, I looked at his article. I'm like, this is pretty good. Addressed a lot of the concerns that people were talking about. And, and he did it in a great way. And he, the key thing that I remember from that article is he talked about the modern military family. 
And to me, that was like a foreign concept because I, I even told my wife, I said, I think we're part of the traditional military family because this modern, you know, thing, it, it's a thing. Well, you got both parents working. You got um, both parents yes, working, sir. both want careers. I mean, yes, and it's not that like my spouse didn't want a career. She had a career, you know, up to a point. And, but at some point, depending on, you know, where you go and what you do, then you need to have to come to agreement. And that's what spouses, you know, constantly do. I mean, it's compromise. Marriage in and of itself is a compromise. It's two imperfect people striving for perfection, right? Now you take that and you put a military career on top of it. And, and there's a lot of compromise in terms of what goals do you pursue? What do you really want, you know, as a goal? But it's really that couple. And, and the one thing that we've never tried to do is put our kids in lead of that. Right. I mean, as we look at it, again, a personal perspective, I always use crazy analogies. My team knows that there, there's, you know, a, a love sled sled dog. I, I've never done, you know, sled dogging, but, but you got two lead sled dogs. Right. And, and that's me and the spouse and, and the kids are not ahead of me and the spouse. And so, you know, we've always tried to line things up. What's best for our family? Not not the one kid, not this kid, the entire family, that collective view and perspective. And then when it comes to career, same thing. Which group, mine or yours? I mean, we could, we could try to have both. We know the difficulty in that. We know yes, some of the separation that's going to cause everything else. But what is that collective, you know, decision compromise we're going to come to at the end of the day? In 1957, Sir General Clark wrote an article, and he provided 15 recommendations mm -hmm. to determine whether or not you're ready for command. Three of them centered on the family. Mm -hmm. Do you think those comments are relevant today, or, or would you not include that? In the article, because that caused a lot of stir. Yeah, no, and I use that caused a lot of stir in the pre command course because the yes. first time I did that in the pre command course, you know, one of the you know future battalion commanders stood up and said, "Sir, the first three I disagree with." Yes, sir. I would say no to. Okay, yes, sir. But it's from a perspective, and again, the the timeliness of that with regard to just how long that's been around. I mean, since the fifties, like you said, with General Clark. When I look at those questions, because I've gone through it multiple commands over thirty three years. I would say yes to all of those because they, they, they apply, they speak to me. Yes, sir. I think it's how you read them. And I just had this conversation yesterday with another pre-command course. The, one of the, the top three points he lays out is, you know, with regard to the spouse, you know, will she give up her time? I mean, I'm not quoting it exactly, you know, her time, you know, when needed, you know, for the good of the, the community, the Army community. But he's talking about the organization. So you have to kind of understand where that person is coming from as well. And it's when needed. Yes, sir. And when I, and so, because one of the commanders asked a question about SFRGs, you know, Soldier Family Readiness Group, and I said, first and foremost, don't think your spouse has to run that, right? That that is kind of an unwritten. Your spouse doesn't have to be the lead of the SFRG. You know, find a person that's passionate about it, has the energy, the focus that you can trust, that is going to do the right thing by the group and the organization. But it doesn't have to be your spouse. Your your spouse may work as an example, but when needed. And, and how do you show a model to your command? Because I said, your command is not going to be all single. I don't care what level you command at. Look, look at your formation, and it's not going to be all single. So how do you show that model of what a family looks like, what good cohesion between you know a, a couple looks like to that organization? Because they're going to be married. They're looking up to see where those examples are. And, you know, and it doesn't mean your spouse has to be around all the time or give up you know, all of her time to certain things is when needed. My wife and I have that agreement right now. You come to what you're comfortable with and what you have time for. And when you look at any profession, sir, I mean, doctors, lawyers, you have to give up something. So right. really it's no, it's no difference. Yeah. Always a compromise. It, it, it really is, sir. So is it fair to compare the military to corporate America? I don't think so. And the key caveat I would apply, because a lot of times we, we do that and we have to be careful about that. Corporate America doesn't deploy. They don't take an oath the way we do. They don't have to fight and win our nation's wars. Key difference. We're not a business. We're a profession. So just those standard things along. And again, anything any of us say today is debatable, right? You know, it's, it's, it's debatable. But that's okay. But but we all took the oath. We've all gone through, you know, our military education deployments. I mean, those type of things, those that have gone through deployments. But we're not. We're not corporate America. They yes, don't sir. do what we do. Yes, you know, nobody there signed up to do, you know, what we do wearing the cloth of our nation. So, sir, I'm going to open this up to the rest of the panel, but I'm going to start with you. Is command a privilege or is it a requirement? 
It is a privilege. In my book, it is a privilege all day long because we have options. I mean, I tell people there's two things in life you have to do, die and make choices. Yes, sir. You have a choice, right? And, and most people say die and pay taxes. You know, a lot of people don't pay taxes, but, you know, but, <laughs> but make choices. You're going to make a choice every day throughout your life. And, and it is a privilege, but it's a privilege because as a commander, what you are given the privilege to do is lead our nation's most precious resource, yes, sons and daughters. Yes, sir. Right? And so every time, that's the ultimate responsibility that you have. And, oh, by the way, you know, train them for whatever, you know, mission you have as an organization. If you were to deploy or go into combat, the responsibility of, of getting them there and bringing them back. Yes, and, and, and so it's a privilege to do that. And one thing that I, I always lay out in terms of, you know, leaders and commanders, never forget, you know, our subordinates get a vote in the privilege. Our subordinates get a vote in the leadership that we have the, the privilege to provide. Yes, sir. Right? And it, in, in that point alone, it is a privilege. Yes, and so you may be the commander, you may be the leader of a particular organization, but everybody around you still gets a vote in that leadership you have the privilege of providing. And it is a privilege all day. Since you're the youngest, let's start with you. What are your thoughts? Sir, <laughs> so my, my thoughts are, are similar. I, I think it's absolutely a privilege. Um, and, and the reason being is, you know, I took command at 28 years old and uh, took, took my company to Afghanistan and, uh, you know, nearly 100 soldiers. And, it's, you know, the amount of responsibility, impact you have not only on soldiers' lives, but their, their livelihood, right? Their, their families. It's so, much, it's so much more grand than um, just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm leading soldiers because I'm also leading families. I'm also leading soldiers' children, you know, that... Hopefully they trust that, you know, their mother, father will come back safely. Um, and then just, you know, the amount of responsibility put on a company commander, uh, especially in a combat zone, like, hey, go shut down this fob, Captain Robbie Shaw. Like, okay, <laughs> 28, 29 years old, here I go out, out the door to shut down the fob. Like, got it, boss. Um, so, yeah, absolutely a privilege. Do you think you were prepared? I do. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I was prepared not so much from – having leaders show me the right thing to do, but also leaders showing me the wrong thing to do. Um, and I think that's one thing uh, when, when, when young captains, young officers are having these bad experiences, it's almost okay. It, you know, it, it's, it's a molding uh, experience, right? I'm, I'm learning, okay, hey, yeah, you're giving me this bad experience. But now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take command, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give anybody else that experience. What would you say to these junior officers that believe that, hey, uh, I've experienced command. I don't want any parts of that. So I, honestly, sir, I respect it um, because, you know, I have tell people to this day, I say the moment I, I put my boots on in the morning and my heart's not 100% into it, I need to step down. If that's at 19 and a half years, I need to get out of the way because, you know, soldiers joining the Army today, they expect to be led well. Yes. Their families expect them to be led well. Um, they don't come to work, hope like, man, I, I really hope, Captain Robichaud's heart is 100% into it today. Yeah. Like, you know, go back to my time in Afghanistan. Like, man, I hope Captain Robichaud is making this decision to send us out on a clear mind. Like, it's expected yeah. and it's required. Yeah. And so if my heart's not 100% into it. These, these junior officers, their heart's not 100% into it. I respect them for being able to see themselves and say, I'm not into it. Um, I, I, need, I can't do it. But there should be a responsibility to continue to refine those skills that they were deficient in, in command so that if the opportunity came at the battalion brigade level that you know, they'll be prepared to take command. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with that. And uh, you know, one thing that uh, I think the Army has gotten away with a little bit you know, with COVID is, is you know, I remember as a lieutenant, LPDs were, were monthly, in person. Yeah. And you know, I know COVID, you know, and, and there's only so much of a, an effect you yes. can have over teams, right? Like, yeah. As a logistics officer, a lot of our LPDs were focused around maintenance, and, yeah. and you got to be in the motor pool. You can't. I can't sit here and talk you through a 5988 over teams or yeah. how to PMCS a truck over teams. Yeah. And so if I'm deficient somewhere as a leader, um, my senior leaders owe it to me. You know, as, as General Beagle and I came from 10th Mountain, we always say, "Pull me up." You know, I'm climbing the glory. Like, be that guy up top on the mountain, pull me up. Um, because as a senior leader, I, I look at you just as I expect my soldiers to look at me to have your heart 100% into it uh, to pull me up. Yeah. Let's, let's Dr. Brian, before you, before you jump over, one, yes, one other point, going back to you know, General Clark's paper, the yes, very sir. last question yes, is, do you want a command for the privilege of commanding or do you want it to have it on your record? 
And I think it goes to your point. Is it a requirement or is it a privilege? And, and I've had those conversations with the time commanders because it, they think one thing, but they say sounds a different way. And, and I've had those conversations. So what, what you're saying is you, you really want the command to have it on your record. No, that's not really what I'm saying, but you know, well, that's, that's kind of what you're saying. I mean, it's the way you're articulating it. But, but I'll leave it there. I know you want to jump to the other side, but I wanted to make sure that point was there as, as framing as well. Do you think it's just an isolated problem on that point, though, sir? Or do you think the majority of the Army, looking at Lieutenant Colonel, Major, Captain, do you think they feel this way? I would say a lot. Just in terms of opinion, I wouldn't say, and I can't speak for, like, the entire Army, but, you, but can, I've seen a lot of it, a lot think that. Because, again, it's in terms of what they want to achieve, then they know that is a route. And we always talk about, you know, what's the path? Well, a path to drill officer. Well, command's going to be along that path for some, a majority of your branches. So some will look at it. Well, I want to achieve this, so I've got to get through these requirements. Well, why are you, why are you really doing it? You know, to begin with, if 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 that is your goal from like Jump Street, you know, then th there's something in me that says that not necessarily the right the right approach. I want to stay on that, sir, because I will tell you. Do you think that this? Younger generation, they're just not bought into the Army like you and I were in the past. Uh, you think it's a generational thing? I just think it's an understanding of buying into the military. Because at the point of, you know, 10 to 12 years average for your, you know, your majors, at that point, now you're part of the enterprise. I mean, if you're captain and below, I kind of get it. You're not completely bought in yet. But I think most in the Army recognize and understand that. You're... You're at a younger stage. You're you're feeling your way through and really understand. We're trying to grow you as a professional, you know, during those you know initial you know early age. I would call it kind of the infancy, you know, through captain, where you're just really figuring things out. But once you hit that field grade level, now you're part of the enterprise. I mean, you you're part of, and go back to your corporate example. You're you're, <laughs> you're part of the corporation now at that point. And, and and the further you go, you're just buying more into. Uh, here's what our enterprise is, what it does, and you have a full and broader understanding of it. What are your thoughts? Is command a requirement or a privilege? I also think that command is a privilege and I'm, my perspective is always from the people perspective. So when you, when I think of it as a privilege is like you're being trusted to be a servant leader, um, influence a change and not just for the mission that's in front of you, but the person. So while I was in command, I had most of my enjoyment or fulfillment by seeing soldiers achieve personal milestones that maybe they didn't think was achievable while accomplishing the mission. So it's kind of in, in building that empowerment that you can see as an individual, because you have to remember that these soldiers are, you know, 18, 19 years old, so they're still growing as adults too. Yeah. So as a leader, you have a dual role and focus on the mission, but you also got to look at the person and try to develop those individual skills. So I, I think it's a privilege that the parents can feel safe and trust that their soldier is being looked out for, but also their child, you know, John or Katie is also being looked out for and helping them as a community, like each one teach one. So definitely a privilege to be a servant leader and build the trust. What were some of the uh, challenges that you experienced in command? What was your biggest challenge? I would say my biggest challenge in command during the time was really, I would say with myself, because some of the sound challenges I had with soldiers I always had to step back to look at the situation for what it is. So don't take it personal. So I learned a lot as far as myself, like how can I shift ASMED and I got my checks with between the chaplain and any other agencies that we have. They were also the check to see, okay, am I doing something that I don't see for myself? So I actually grew as I'm growing as an adult too. Shirtle still has to grow, but then Captain Harris is still growing. So trying to find that balance and still keep everything in line. But I was fortunate enough not to have any big significant soldier issues because I don't really think anything is an issue if you can get through the other side. So everybody was safe. So I figured, okay, it was a good command. Did you feel that PME prepared you to assume command? For, for the adjutant general course, you know, we primarily, our key development is staff. So mm -hmm. I think uh, see our career course more focused on pre preparing us for battalion as one. Mm -hmm. Where I felt I was prepared for command was really everything I learned up to that point, because I'm an OCS officer, so I was prior service prior to commissioning. So I grant a lot of my leaders, so like Captain Rob Robeshaw was saying, what we see over time, 
you instill those principles. So you, who you are as a person, I always say, you know, you take uniform off at the end of the day and that's who you are. Your character is who you are. So if you try to pretend for the eight hours or 12 hours that you work during the day, eventually you're going to be exposed. So I was always, I always tried to stick to just being instilled to what I learned from leaders seeing them. So career course for me, particularly for the adjutant general course, definitely didn't directly line us up for command, but it did line us up to being responsible, taking accountability, working hard, and doing due diligence, which all characteristics to being a leader. And when you look at development, there are three legs, institution, organizational, and yourself. Once you complete a command, what are some of the things you can do to better prepare yourself in the event, you know, you attain the rank of lieutenant colonel and move on to the battalion? Level? What, what are some of the things that you can do to better prepare yourself? To, the, to better prepare myself, sir, for that next level, it would be, if I had to do it all over again, would still focus on self-development, but also keep, my, keep being more aware of my OE, like the operational environment. Yeah. So actually knowing what's going on outside of my circle or square, yeah. just so you can also, one, inform decisions that are not just so stovepipe. Yeah. So just being more consciously aware about anything that's going on, organizational, up, down, lateral. Mm -hmm. So when you inform decisions or even uh, be able to provide resources to your soldiers, you your inform. So yeah. if it's preparing anything as you're going through the steps is, continuously to learn, whether it's professional or personal, but always try to make sure that your, your shot group is type as far as like what's going on currently. So you yeah. want to be relevant anytime you have the opportunity to take the stand. Emotional intelligence. Yes, sir. Yeah. Turn over to you, Mike. So on the question of whether it is a privilege or a requirement, I think it is easy for, as General Beagle spoke to a young officer, to see uh, a branch path and say that, well, that's one of the requirements to continue to move on in and to do the thing that I, I, I want. Um, but I, I'll, I'm going to agree with, with Sherdo wholeheartedly. I think for me, and I think her and I are aligned, both of us really espouse the, the servant leader mindset. And I honestly got more out of command um, from the people that I was able to help move to different um, positions and, and things in their lives and helping people talk through the, the same questions that, that our young captains are having. Um, some of those that didn't want to command, there were many other different ways that they could serve in our army that better met what they wanted out of their lives. And so I'm extraordinarily proud. I have a, I have a one of my young lieutenants is about to graduate from law school. Um, she was a assistant S6 and wanted to, wanted to branch out and go that direction. And, and this summer she'll graduate from LSU. We got her into the FLEP program. Um, I had a, a young Meadow who was dead set that he wanted to be a helicopter pilot and wanted to be a medevac pilot. And we got him into school and he's going through the course right now. Um, it's helping those young officers get to their real goals. And, and to do that as a leader, you have to be engaged at the individual level. And so from the start, my initial counselings with my young leaders were focused on that and understanding where they wanted to go, not just in the Army, but in life, and what their goals were, and then finding concrete ways to help move that direction. Um, that kind of leadership and trying to figure out ways to both connect them with the right people and to remove the obstacles that are in their way was kind of how I focused everything that I did uh, when I was in command. And that privilege to be able to do that for folks was paid back to me in spades, uh, just that knowing that you had the ability to help people be better versions, the best version of themselves. Uh, and that doesn't mean that if somebody wants to get out of the Army, um, it's a bad thing. Everyone who was in our formations, they've already sacrificed more than most people. They've already made the decision to come into our, into our Army, to wear the cloth of our nation, and to do things on behalf of our nation to help. Um, and I can, I can go on forever, but I, I think you support them in everything that they want, and you build trust in your organization. And I think that's important. But for those officers that have decided that they don't want to command, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think about that? Should there be a dual track, i.e., you, know, you enter the Army and you stay on staff, and that's what you do your entire career, or the command track? 
because that's what they're talking about out well, in the field. So I think to a certain extent, the Army's already gotten to a, a part of that with functional areas. And so there are, I, I helped one of my young captains who finished his company command and really wanted a different path for himself based off of his family and his own desires. And he's going to become a, um, a fail. And that lines up with his desire to travel, his desire to experience new cultures and to do those things. It is a path. And that's a path that we should talk about more. Every officer that we can help find their passion in the Army is a win, both for the officer and for the Army. I don't, I am passionate about armored, armored warfare. I love tanks. Anybody who was in my battalion, I tell you, I, I love them. I, I live on it, but not everybody's that way. And if you can find that passion for that person and help them get to it, they're going to be better for themselves, their families, and for the Army. My, my thought process is that, and I think you'll agree with this, and I think, sir, you'll agree with this as well, command is a skill set. And what I mean by that, you just can't pick up the guide on and command. And then when you look at history, you look at warfare, you know, the possibility, because we're a land force, of being wiped out, that entire chain of command, I believe if I'm correct, during the Korean War, we had a sergeant commanding a company because the entire chain of command was wiped out. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? So I, I had a, this is one where COVID actually helped. <laughs> I was, uh, I was blessed and cursed to go through an NTC rotation under COVID. Uh, and while I was at that NTC rotation, uh, I had uh, my infantry company commander, who may be watching this, uh, get uh, exposed to COVID and his XO and two of the other platoon leaders and most of the platoon sergeants. And uh, I ended up with uh, a young second lieutenant leading my infantry company through NTC, uh, going into Rajesh and, and going and fighting. Um, I will say, did he do it perfect? No. Uh, but Mason Beebe, if you're out there, he, he, he did way better than anyone expected. He did so well that I made him my scout platoon leader. Uh, and he was the lead for us as the battalion, in my eyes and ears, when we went forward on our next, our next things. Um, I think none of us were perfect when we went into command. Yes. I know I wasn't. I was still being developed. Yes. I, but I think a lot of that development, and you, you asked her the question about whether PME prepares you, I truly believe in the 70-20-10 principle that that 70% of your development as an individual comes from the experience, from going and learning on the job. And, from, yes. and it doesn't come from the job that you're in, it comes from the job that was before that. Yes. And so when I looked at how I placed my officers, those that had the desire and thought they might want to command, you had to find a position for them where they would grow in that. And that's, in my, in my profession, that's being a company XO. This gives you the best view of the hard things that go along with command yes. and gets them most prepared for that. 10% of their growth is going to come from Captain's career course. And most of it's oriented on the staff position that they'll follow on to immediately following. Not as much on command. There's some in there. But that's not where their growth comes from. And the other 20% is from your peers. And mm -hmm. understanding from your peers, your subordinates, your senior superiors, that feedback on how it worked for them and how maybe it will work for you. And so I think you can deal with those mass casualties, because the, the seed corn is out there. It's in our formations. And will it be perfect when somebody steps up? No. But are they going to learn? And, and are they going to be the person that can step in that role? Absolutely. If any of us ever thinks that we're an irreplaceable cog, we're doing the wrong things. If we've created a structure in our units where if I'm not there, this thing can't function, we're all in the wrong place. And that climate is most important. You know, the key is developing that climate where, because that's where development whole nine yards, mentorship. I'd go even a step further. I think climate is a start. Yes. But culture is the real thing you're looking for. Culture is very hard to change. Culture is very hard to change. Yeah. And I, I, I can talk about this for hours, so yeah. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Yeah. But if you get to a place where there is a, a culture in your unit that you can fail and you can learn and you can trust each other, yes, it makes everything work. Yes. And that is one of the few things that a commander, particularly at the battalion level, is one of the few things General Beagle always talks about, do those things that only you can do. Exactly. In a battalion, you are the one, and that's one of the only things, you, you're the only person who can set that culture. Now it takes everybody to buy into it, and you gotta work through how to do that. But that's absolutely, that was the critical point for me, 
when I was in battalion command was I focused 90% of my effort that on my time that was available, I focused it on trying to find ways to build that culture to get people to buy into it. So, so I want to go a little deeper on that question about the dual track. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Should there be a track for staff and one for command? And I agree with Mike in terms of the Army's, you know, adjusted to get us, you know, on that path. And as you were talking, there was one book I was trying to think of, and it won't come, the, the title would not come to my brain right now. But it, it, you know, it talks about you having a variety of experiences that just make people better, you know, over time. Your, your athlete that, that played music, that learned a different language, they're, they're, they're just better over time because they're, they're adaptable. But I think our, our Army system, when, when you factor in command staff positions, is designed that way too, because as you get more senior, you want to have all those experiences. And, and that's the key part, I think, that most don't understand about being a general. And somebody was very clear to me before I pinned on the first start. They said, you're going to go from a specific officer to a general officer, which means you're generally good at like everything. You, you're not you know, the expert at it, but you generally understand everything. And then you look back at all your experiences is Hopefully, you've had a variety of experiences in different parts of our enterprise, everything else leading up to that point. If not, then you're, you're kind of stovepiped in. So I think in terms of you know, creating and developing our general officers, I would say, yes, you have to have certain things in there because you won't be good generally across the board if you've only experienced like one thing or one part of our Army or one specific side of our Army. Then generally, at that point in time, it's going to be hard for you to spread out. It's kind of like teaching the old dog new tricks. It's going to be hard to learn some of those new tricks because you hadn't been exposed to them for 20 plus 30, 30 years. I think in some cases, if that is not, you know, part of the goal, and I don't think it's the goal for everybody, I agree with Mike. You know, people, we should align people with their passion. Where do you go? I use my own son as an example. He followed my path into the infantry. And I said, okay, one, rule number one, don't try to be me, right? Because you got to be you. And, and, I, I love what I do. Infantry, I've never thought about anything else. And later on, he decided to VTIP to PAO. Well, he majored in broadcast journalism. That was, that was his thing. And he, he got the experience. He you know, commanded on the TRADOC side. He had a lot of experience on the force comp side. So again, well balanced. And then now he's doing something that he's passionate about, but he's, he's seen multiple parts of the Army. And I can tell he's passionate about it. And he'll probably stay a little bit longer because... Now he's found that niche. It's like, this is comfortable. It's not going to work every day. This is something I get up, I'm happy about every day, and it's really not, not a job. That's the alignment that you want. And then the further he goes, he still has a good base of you know, varied experiences and different sides of our Army to, to pull upon you know, over time. So is the Army really listening to the concerns of junior officers electing to resign or not compete for command? Do you think the Army's listening? Oh, yeah, because, I mean, the results, the stats are talked about all the time, especially when you talk about the command assessment program, CAP and, and VCAP, the time command assessment program. They look at those numbers and stats, and very concerning, at least a couple of years ago, how many of our O5 lieutenant colonels were opting out. So a lot of research, a lot of work put into trying to determine okay, why, why are folks, like, opting out. And, and I don't think all of it was because of command. I think there were other things that CAP was in place to do, which I completely agree with CAP. Uh, and even the changes, there's a new change now with CAP and how that, that program works. But it's, it's weeding out those that may have not personally or professionally developed at that point in time to say, you're ready for command or you're not ready for command. Because that was part of our problem, your point back to climate and everything else. You can't set a good climate, have a good culture if you're not a good person. I mean, I'll just make it simple as that. And to be able to see that and and pull those out of, of the process, out of the, out of the pipeline to give them time. And it's not, you're, you're com completely out, but give you time to see yourself, be self-aware, self-reflection, everything else. Again, because we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater is you need to relook yourself and what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you function as a human, as an individual, and then put you back in because you're going to go command. That was the, the simple version of, of cap. So I, I completely agree with how we're doing that. But I think over time, we, we should no longer need it because if we're doing things right with leader development, self-development, leveraging all three pillars, yes, then you won't need that. Career-long yes, assessments, then you're seeing yourself the entire time and you know exactly where you're suited, what your, your strengths are, what your undeveloped skill sets are. And, and we can put you know, leaders in the right position, in the right formations, in the right part of our army. 
What are your thoughts on mentorships? Or do you think that general officers should take a more active role in developing? I know you guys are busy, uh, but what are your thoughts on mentorship? And one, I never use the word busy. <laughs> I do a lot of mentoring, and it, and it happens over the weekend. So, I mean, they're, they're, my answer is always is never no. It's just a matter of when. And, and you have to. You have to do a lot of mentoring. But it's a two-way street. And I, th I think I've, I've written when I was a colonel a lot about mentoring and just the, the, the perceptions of what mentoring really is. And, and one, I think from a protege perspective, you have to pursue it. And, and a lot of times a mentor is going to be attracted to that protege because they see something in themselves. That is the difference with me between good leadership. I provide everybody good leadership. That is what every leader owes everybody in that organization, good leadership. And then here's the debatable part. But again, you can do your own research and, and study. Mentoring is a little bit different because now I'm going to invest a little bit more time in, in a certain individual or multiple individuals because, one, I see something in them different than everybody else. I more than likely see something in them that I saw in myself or somebody saw in me that gets you that investment in time, that ability to build a more trusting relationship, and then give you that you know, ability to communicate on a more transparent level with that individual a little bit different than good leadership, but good leadership follows those, those exact same, same lines. And hopefully everybody drifts into a good mentorship relationship based on their branch, based on, you know, it's not always based on rank, their position, what they want to do. I mean, there's a different connection to get you into a mentoring relationship, but I think those should all occur. And I know everybody doesn't get it. And it's unfortunate that everybody doesn't you know, get that opportunity to, to be mentored. Yes, sir. What would you say, sir, to a junior officer who might disagree that the Army requirements decreased during PME and broadening opportunity? That generated a lot of discussion as well. They don't see a sine wave. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Mike. because Mike and I had that conversation about the sine wave. And I mean, again, it was agreement. But again, we, we agreed in terms of putting it in there. Mm -hmm. and, and we got feedback. So we got, we got some feedback before we published. And somebody said, you might not. You might want not want to make that so steep and so deep and so steep and so deep. Because they and don't I'm like, see. So. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you're right. It's not as deep and it is deep, but there's something to it that I fundamentally agree. And you asked about what was taken out of context. I think that graphic and just how people some things they read like you just took it as it was. Some things you read too deeply into. I think the sine wave was something. My perspective, you read too deeply into it, yes, right? Sir. But I'll, I'll let Mike take it and I'll. Yeah. So I think the difficulty is always trying to. Um, explain the experiences of an entire army in, in one way. Um, I, I think one of the, it was from the Reddit, they said, uh, one of the comments said, this is a sine wave, experiences may vary. I absolutely agree. Um, I think everybody does have, and I think more agency now in the time of AIM-2, to be able to adjust whether or not they have those, those valleys inside of their career. Uh, I think every unit is different. Op tempo in different units is different. I, the response that came out um, from the ADA officer, I absolutely empathize with them. I think the ADA communities, they're, they're in a rough place with respect to op tempo. Um, but um, I think for young captains, uh, the perspective as I talked to mine was, it's really hard right now and I'm working my butt off as a commander. And then I look at the major that's next to me who's doing their KD time and they're they're grinding hard. And I look up and it doesn't seem like it gets better. And so the conversation and that graphic came from a whiteboard session that I had with my commanders. I kind of just talked it over and I said, look, you're seeing the majors at the hardest part of their career, or the hardest part of their, their time as a, as a major. You're not seeing them when they're at ILE and they're home at, at 1630 and they're going to soccer practice with their kids and they have predictability and they're not going out to the field. And, and then I asked them, when you were at the captain's career course, did you have predictability? Did you know your schedule for the entire time you were there? Did you generally get home on time and have dinner with your family every day? The answer is yeah. And so they can see that first that first drop when it's at, at the captain's career course. But unless you talk about it and you talk about you know the potentials for broadening assignments and where you go, they don't see the next step. And that's kind of the reason I wanted to have it in there is I think it gives the ability to have the discussion about how your career can go. And then it aids in the conversation if you're going to choose to skip one of those. And so there are many jobs out there that will fill in those gaps. And if you choose to go to those positions, it should be something that you do 
with your eyes wide open and understanding the effect it'll have on yourself and your family and the balance that you're trying to create. And it's absolutely okay for officers to make those decisions. But from my perspective, it's, it's not okay for them to make that without understanding the, the, the opportunity cost. And so that was kind of the thought in putting that in there. Is everybody's career going to follow that perfect sine wave? No. no. Are there some careers where people have made decisions or are in places where that'll stay high? Yes. Um, you can't describe the entire Army's individual experiences in one graph. I think some people looking for the words, take a knee, because we, we never said that. You know, and that's what some, I think, tried to interpret it as, take a knee. Well, you don't really get to take a knee. I saw some of you know comments about that. So we never said, you know, you're going to take a knee. And it all depends, too. Personality, I mean, just how, if you're, if you're a triple type A, guess what? You're going to come to school, and, and people ask me, somebody asked me the other day, like, you know, they say the year here at Leavenworth is the best year of your life. It wasn't for me. Because, again, triple A personality, you're pursuing, like, different goals, you're you're trying to get straight A's. I'm trying to go from CJSC to SAM. So, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's still a dip. It's a dip. I get home on time. Everything's predictable, all that. But it's like, what did you put on yourself? The Army didn't put that on me. That was me putting that on me to get to that point. Another good example is sitting right beside me with Captain Robichaud. So, you know, even as a captain, he, he's had it like been at the top of it, kind of come down for a little bit. Then once we both got out here, I'm like, I need you to come in to be my aide again because I hired a new one, but they're not going to be in in time. I need you to cover this, this gap, this large gap. So now he's back at the top of that peak, you know, so probably he's got a pretty good perspective too. <laughs> yeah. So I'll say the, the sine wave hasn't been uh, my experience is, you know, again, because like General Beagle said, I mean, company after company command, typically uh, my peers would go to grad school, they'd go be OCs and I went to be a battalion S3 and then, you know, an aide for the past 18 uh, months. <laughs> so I, I've, I've only accelerated. Um, but I, I do think, you know, going back to one of Colonel Soika's points, though, we, we do largely in part uh, have a say in that with, with the AIM process. You know, yeah. we can select our jobs. I think what a lot of junior officers get wrapped around is chasing the big bad, you know, well, my boss said if I go be an OC, like, I'm definitely going to get promoted to major. I'm like, okay, I mean, if, if that's your thought process, if that's what you're being told, then yeah, but you're not going to have that valley in the sine wave, like, your experience will will differ, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, a lot of that, I would say, about seventy five percent of that dif difference is, is self controlled. So, cool. so is the army considering the total requirements of commanders in their units? Yeah, the one thing, and I, I say yeah very quickly because I know you know over the past at least five years, and there was not the current secretary, previous secretary, you know, did the math. I mean, walked it out. How many requirements are on you know just a company? level commander, and I forget the exact number to date, but it, I mean, it was more requirements. It's kind of like our, our joke about 350-1. There's more requirements than you have time in a year to get done. But but some things are written, you know, in certain ways for a reason. And the SMA pointed that out. The SMA, at one point, Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinston, you know, took a little bit of flack as he stood up in a public audience and said, some of that mandatory training stuff, you don't, you don't have to do it. Well, well, he's right if you read the regulation in terms of a two-star level commander and say, here's what we're not doing. You know, and we're not we're not going to do. I mean, as a division commander, I had that that authority to to do and make make those adjustments. But even beneath that, in command, brigade command, battalion command, there are certain things even without that authority that I can have conversations with my bosses. Going, you know, we we can't get all this done in a particular time. Here's the priority, what's important, and then work our way, you know, into a negotiation of we can focus on these, but given what we're doing. These will have to maybe not go to the side, but they're they're layered. They can't happen in a certain time frame. So you kind of unpack what is on top of you and take away that overwhelming feeling of so many admin things on top of you as a commander. But you know, in terms of how much is there, it's still a point, you know, and I wouldn't say of debate, but but how much comes out. But I think as you look at the echelons of command, there's a lot of authority in there to pull some of those things out that you know, we, you can look at your command, whatever command you're in, and go, yeah, we don't necessarily need to do this. We're, we're not, you know, bucking the Army, you know, in that sense of saying we're not going to do what the Army said. Army's given a little bit of leeway to say, well, you don't have to do this, this, or this, right, depending on where you're at and what unit uh, you, you command or are a part of. Let's turn to uh, Mike. What, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so, first, I absolutely agree that, we have the ability, and the Army has asked us to reduce those administrative requirements. I will also say that my company commanders felt the weight of those. 
and some of them are are different than when we were in command in in different ways. Uh, so my company commanders had property books that were four times the size of mine, just based on the way that they have broken down bombs and all the other things, the way that it's done now, it is a significant time for time constraint. Uh, and I think we do at Echelon hold on, even though the army said to take away in 2018 multiple things, um, there are people at Echelon that have held on to some of those requirements. And simple ones being something like a leave form. Uh, and the only thing you need to put in for a leave form is a leave form uh, based off of the, the army's requirements. But in many, many, Units in many places, they you need to show your your green on your med pros, and you have um, you've got a trips report, and you've done all these other things. Um, so some of the things are self inflicted, and those are the conversations that I had with both my company commanders and with my brigade commander uh, about things that were at my echelon to be able to to take away from them. We just said no. I'm, we're just going to have a leave form, um, and then. It's about when. Um, and so as a battalion commander, when we started laying out our training schedules, I accounted for some of those things right up front. Uh, as an armor officer, maintenance is huge. So laying out our services and our maintenance schedule, absolutely. We also laid in where everybody's inventories were going to go uh, in the time and space. And then when we put all the training on top of it, it enabled a conversation from me to the brigade commander when other things came down other administrative requirements, other things, I was empowered by the information that we had gathered about all the things that everybody was doing to have a conversation with him about risks and costs uh, and then potentially shifting or, or waiving some of the requirements. And I think as a leader, you have to have those conversations. Part of being a servant leader is removing the barriers to success from your, from your subordinates. And that's the way I looked at it. I wasn't trying to be an umbrella that held everything away from them. For their path to success, I would find that thing that they couldn't breach, and I would breach it for them. And I would take the time to be able to get that big thing out of the way so they could focus on solving the problems that were at their echelon. Uh, I think that has to be a thing that happens at, at every unit because there is no cookie-cutter approach. Because there are some units that need to do some sorts of mandatory training. And it's vastly different depending on your organization. It creates a point of discussion. Well, it has to be because it can't, again, just like trying to draw a diagram for everybody in the Army, you can't just say every company battery or troop in the Army needs to do these things because the, the company that Sherdo commanded, vastly different from the one that I was commanding, and they have different needs. And so that conversation has to happen at a, at a unit level, and that should be something that company commanders are striving for. I know everybody hates sitting in an SATB, a semi-annual training brief. But it is an opportunity for your voice to be heard by your senior rater about the things that need to be adjusted to be able to allow you to succeed. Uh, one point I just want to double tap on too, when you really cut through it, you just cut through you know, everything. It, it boils down to two things. From what I've seen in my experience, and Mike, Mike hit it without really saying it directly, is a lot of additional requirements get added because you have leaders, subordinates that want to cover themselves. You want to cover your backside, right? But it goes back to your climate and everything else. So again, I'm gonna, if I say your requirement is a leave form, somebody's gonna say, well, I, I need your trip support. I need I need to see your med pros. Everything else, because now you're thinking you're trying to cover yourself. Even if that's not the the climate or the culture I want in that organization. Again, we all come from different places, and this could be somebody that's been around, you know, for a couple of years. But I've heard stories. I heard this. I may need to cover myself because if something goes bad, then I don't want to be on the blame line. Well, okay. If but if the leader is saying and the and the culture, the environment is right. No, leave for him. If something. Bad happens, like, okay, I'm not going to come at you personally and go, what, what did you not do? But that happens. And unfortunately, that happens to where now I think I need to do all this because I'm covered just in case. It's like packing a rucksack, right? I mean, it's like an infantryman. You give me a bigger ruck, guess what we're going to do? You're going to put more stuff in it just in case. I don't need it, but I'm going to put it in just in case, right? Yes, and then the other point is, and I, and, I, and I say this to, you know, battalion and brigade level commanders too, and even our one and two stars that come through for, you know, ASAP C command is nobody takes anything away. So I'll always say, well, the Army wants me to do this, but what, what, what did you add on top of that that you didn't, you didn't say anything about? Because as you go at Echelon, I may have two priorities, and I've been in command plenty of times to say, when I go into a command, I've added, okay, here are my three priorities, here are the three big things. Well, if the brigade commander kept his three and added my three, now you've got six. 
The tag commander came in with his three, my three. You know, you, the numbers keep. So who's pulling something away at some point? Because everybody's going to hold on to their thing. So now my internal little admin requirements that I'm really not counting because Army didn't say that, but I'm not really going to count it. It's invisible, but it's another requirement. So the numbers are adding up and it's like, we're, we're, we're the frog in our own pot of hot water and we're turning up the heat on ourselves and we don't even know it, you know, because nobody's pulling anything away. So the first thing I look for, and this team is my witness coming in because the commander said it, like sort of battle rhythm. <laughs> look at the battle rhythm, like, oh my God. Because I mean, I've got several touch points. My boss has got several touch points. You've got several touch points. So all your commanders are in meeting. And at some point, I went, once we got the information right, go back to my boss and said, sir, um, they're meeting with you like two times a week. They're meeting with me two times a week. How about we consolidate this? So it's like, you got your touch point. I got my touch point. We give them more time back and, and we go from there. And so you're, you're just pulling things off the plate, like Mike said, versus, it, and you have to unsay versus, but you also have to recognize, what did you put on the plate yourself that you, you're, you're not accounting for? And at the, at the battalion level, we, we kind of had that same discussion. I, I had company commanders that were sitting in all these meetings. And obviously, again, I, as an armor officer, maintenance is absolutely critical to me. So when I sat in the battalion maintenance meetings, it wasn't what the previous guy had done, but I sat in every single one of them. The commanders then felt they had to sit in every single one of those. And then you know, the normal meetings, the commanders, and staffs, all those other things, we had a discussion. I was like, I realize that I'm pulling too much away from you, time from you away from your troops. I don't need you at the battalion maintenance meeting. I need your SMEs, I need your XO, and I need that maintenance sergeant who actually knows what's going on with every piece of equipment. Do I still expect you to understand what's going on with your maintenance program and make decisions as required? 100%. But I don't need you sitting there for an hour and a half with me while I go line by line through all these things. And then you just had to find ways to, to give that time back to allow that. And, and you know, it, it doesn't, you have to listen. You have to be willing to ask the questions because especially when you're new to a unit, Nobody's going to want to tell you you're not wearing clothes. Yep. You, yep. Have to, you have to ask, what, what can we do better? And you have to be able, you have to say it. Because the example Mike used, I used as a division commander. Same exact thing. Brigade commanders, they show up because I'm there. And at one point, I'm like, look, I don't need you at this meeting. There are certain meetings I need the commanders at. There are certain meetings, it's a commander meeting, but I don't need you because there's something else that only you can do that you need to be doing. And it's probably not this. And, and once that was understood, it's like your XO is fine, your deputy is fine. Your sergeant major is fine. We don't we don't leverage our NCO core well enough either. But your your sergeant major is fine. I mean, you two are are paired together. So I would expect your sergeant major can speak one on your behalf and speak in terms of the concerns, issues, and everything else. And once they got it, it they knew environmentally. I'll put it that way. That was not an issue because that was not my expectation. If, if I'm in a meeting, all my commanders got to be there. I mean, that happens now, and I'm, it's not a point of discussion because they understand. That's the environment. Because if you're not there, and that's what I told them, I said, if you're not there, I'm assuming that you're doing something way more important. And if it's dealing with your commander soldiers, that's way more important. Yes, sir. Sean, you just came out of command. What more can be done to reduce the administrative burden that's being placed on command? I don't yeah. want to put you on the spot, but. No, that, that makes perfect sense, sir. I, th I think one thing that can be done is uh, getting the buy-in from your battalion and brigade commanders. Um, you know, one of the things I did as a company commander is this was an issue for me. And it was, you know, as an FSC commander in a field artillery battalion, my howitzer slant was very interesting to the division commander and sometimes the corps commander. I know this. I know it in hindsight, and I knew it in the job. Um, so yeah, I, I need this. I learned how to speak in terms of cost and risk. So my battalion commander and I would have a conversation probably biweekly, saying, "Hey, sir, I'm not blowing off." These requirements, I'm not blowing off this mandatory training. Um, I will do. I'll, I'll stop everything and do it right now. But here's what it costs, and it usually comes at the cost of a howitzer getting, you know, uh, serviced. It comes at the cost of a prime mover getting serviced. And if, if at his level or her level, they're okay accepting that risk, I'm all for it. You know, I, I, I will execute. Um, but just having that conversation and saying, you know, man hours are man hours. I wouldn't expand ex expand my duty day because my soldiers have. You know, sharp and EO different, but anti-terrorism training, like, I'll accept that risk. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay. Can the Army realistically reduce mandatory training when the number of suicides, off-duty accidents, allegations of discrimination, and sharp 
incidents continue to rise. When you look at the stats, it's not decreasing, it's increasing. So I, I think there needs, they need to be prioritized. And, and, and we, need, we as commanders uh, need to have that conversation. And, and we need to know the culture of our division, brigade, battalion, company. We need to know. If I have a drinking issue in my, my company, I, I, I should know about it. Um, but we need to prioritize those things. And, and some things I would not waver off of is, is Sharp, EO in particular, just because I know, hey, my company is not having a problem right now, but it doesn't mean something won't happen tomorrow. And I, I wasn't in the business of being reactive. Oh, somebody just got sexually assaulted in my barracks. We better focus on Sharp training. No, it's too late at that point. Yeah. Um, so we, we yeah, just proactive and prioritize the requirements. But I, I would say consolidated would be, would be my answer. And that's something that we're, we're working. Again, it's not something I control or we can, we can change overnight, but you, you, we can reduce it would be my belief. It is my belief if you consolidate because all of those harmful behaviors and activities are, are, are part of that environment. That, that environment, again, you can't stovepipe them because if you have an environment where you're going to have sharp, there's probably other things may not be manifesting themselves that are, it's because of the environment that you have. So, I mean, you, you have to leverage everything at your disposal to focus on that environment because if the environment, your culture, your climate is good, which is why as an arm, we focus on that so much. I mean, the the four requirements of exemplary behavior out of AR 600-20, that's really all it focuses on, not about training or anything else. It focuses on that climate, that environment, what you're required to do by law as a commander. And it's, it's that focus there. And, and you don't have to bifurcate you know, these things out and, and and split them multiple ways because if my environment is good, because if, if you'll do some something in terms of sexual harassment, you're probably gonna say something inappropriate racially as well because the environment is right for it. And, and, the, and we're gonna have drinking and we're gonna have an environment where, you know, again, nobody feels cared for or connected. So now I'm gonna have suicide you know, ideations or, or gestures or whatever the case may be because they're not connected to that team in that environment, which is why the chief talks about cohesion, cohesive teams. You've gotta form that. So you you minimize the space where you know these these harmful things are going to happen, and that's what you're trying to do. But you've got to look at it well, both eyes wide open and focus everything on the environment and not kind of in the soda straw approach. So I, I want to go back to this work life balance because students are talking about these things. Can we truly obtain work life balance? And if we can, what would be some of your recommendations on, on okay. how to do that? Yeah. Personal point, and I'll give you my answer because I, I, I lay it out at PCC. I bring my spouse in there as well as my witness and, and talk to it about talk about it in other audiences. Given our profession, my belief now, after 33 years, there's no real thing is, or such thing as balance because it's, you're trying to make it equal. It is very hard to do when you're dedicating 10 to 12 hours a day at work, you're deployed, you're to CTC rotation or anything else. It's going to be hard to balance it out. You're missing games, you're missing birthdays. Key events, I mean, those type things. The the chief has a great slide and lays out, you know, how do you know something's important versus urgent? And and, and it works. I mean, if you've got a graduation, wedding, childbirth, you absolutely need to be at that regardless of what it is. Completely agree. But it's still not balanced. I, I talk a lot about harmony and how do you harmonize things given the profession that we're in. And I think that's what, I don't think I know, my, my wife and I have focused on, you know, our entire time. I've been in 33, we've been married for 32 is just achieving that harmony. And again, a lot of time committed to work, to the profession, but then when you're at home, it's, it's quality over quantity, because you're not, you're not gonna get the quantity you know, ever. You're never gonna balance those out. You take leave, and even in those cases, hopefully you're in the right environment where work doesn't go with you. That, that email doesn't go with you, all those type things. You're not getting bothered at night, which is one of the reasons why I created, the, not just me personally, but, but the team at Fort Drum, we implemented the same thing here. Don't be texting people, you know, after certain hours. Don't be texting them before certain hours. That reflects on your training management for the most part. But, you know, don't give people that time because, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is finite. It is precious. It is valuable. But, you know, depending on what job you're in, like, now I'll say, like, for me and the aide and part of this team, some of that's off limits because I mean, they're going to get a late text and we look at what we're doing. Things change. You know, but still, try to minimize it. Be very mindful of doing those things. But, you know, that just can't be the norm across the board, which, Again, it gets you it gets you out of balance if you want to use that term, but you got to do these small things that just get you harmony, you know, with that team. You, you get a weekend off or four day. Hopefully, you're not you know taking a lot of work with you. You're not working a lot of emails, all these type of things. 
because that that time you've got to balance it out in that sense with the unbalanced time that you spend doing everything else. How would you rate the military on its ability to take care of the family, sir? Much better over time. What what I've seen, the resources that we have today compared to when I joined the Army, we have more resources than I've ever seen. Our, our biggest problem, and I've said this to the chief at you know earlier on, our biggest problem is connecting our people to our resources. And we have tons of resources that are out there to help families, all different types of situations for our military connected kids, you name it. One is a lack of knowledge about those resources and programs, and then just being able to, to connect the people to it. But but they're there. I mean, to include the biggest thing have been, you know, spouse employment. I mean, that is the key thing that has caused a lot of states to do reciprocity, licensure, the even with our kids, military connected kids, the interstate uh, compact act. I mean, those things that like our soldiers don't know about, they don't understand. So you can move your kid and they're the number one player on the volleyball team. You may not want to move them to Kansas, but given that that act, you can move them to Kansas and they're guaranteed a spot on the volleyball team when they show up in their new place. Not the team they're on, but you know, so there's a lot of work that's been done that people just simply don't know about. So it's social capital, which means the know-how. We just got to do a better job of, I guess, of educating the families and letting them know hey, these resources or these tools are available at right. their disposal. Just like our spouse development office here at Fort Leavenworth, we're trying to get that bigger across the Army. So if a spouse can take you know, the credentialing, the credits they get, that goes along with them, just like a, a transcript, you know, for, you know, a student. I mean, they get credit for all those things and things that they do, being part of an SFRG. How do you get a credit for that if you want to go get a degree? All those things are out there. I mean, I am like so excited about the amount of resources and programs that are out there, but but I'm also equally unexcited because, again, the knowledge, the knowing, that information being out there and people using our, our soldiers and leaders leveraging that information. I want to switch to uh, schooling, sir. How can the Army better prepare officers for command during PME? What can we do to make their experience better? In, in PME, I think it's going to be hard. It goes back to a point Sherdo made. And when you think generally about what we do on the institutional side of the house, it's not particularly focused on a command position because you're going to spend a majority of your time outside of command. I mean, even the multiple commands I've had over time, it's probably been 20, 30 percent, you know, at this point of my entire career. The rest of that, like everybody else, has been staff jobs and other type of specialty jobs. So you're 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 prepared. Your PME prepares you not only for that, it prepares you for the the levels, tactical, operational, strategic. So you you get a much bigger and larger broadening through your PME. It's just not focused on command. It's all things war fighting. It's all things understanding your war your war fighting. Function. So you get you get that level of broadening, and then you have to scope that down and, and fit that, tailor that, you know, to command. And it's our PCCs, our pre-command courses, that really help you now refine, put pieces together. And we do it at from captain level all the way up to the general officer level. It, is that's where you 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 get things in in the right perspective regarding command. But I think our PMEs in general should stay designed the way they're designed because it just keeps you you brought and not so focused in on one thing that you're you're not going to do your entire career, if that makes sense. It does, sir. I'd like to get your thoughts, Mike. Well, I first, I absolutely agree that Bullock, Captain's Career Course, ILE, they, they are not aiming at the target that you're asking for. That's intentional. Um, as I talked about before, a lot of the things that prepare you for command are naturally those jobs that you've had prior to that. Um, and I think for the captains, um, being prepared to command at a specific installation requires an installation-specific captain's uh, co company commander and first sergeant course, and those are out there across our army. Um, sort of like we talked about before, if you standardize those and try to make them one thing, it won't actually help them connect with the resources that are out there on their installation. And so, um, a, uh, at at one AD at, one, at Bliss, that that course was directed by the by the commanding general. He was the only authority to change those things. And it was about how you prepare someone to command on Fort Bliss and the things and the people that they needed to meet so they had the resources to help their soldiers for the training, et cetera. Those are absolutely vital things. Um, I think the 
having gone through the pre-command course, or sorry, the PCC course, uh, and uh, and then commanded, I think there's still always room to improve. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, I think if we really do are focused on creating the right cultures, then maybe there is a way to wait some of that time. Um, but I think that's just, uh, again, I'm, I'm personally biased towards culture. So, but I think it, it we do in that course and throughout, um, there's, there's opportunities to get yourself right with your branch and specifics when you go down to your branch specific ones. The general one here has a lot of speakers and a lot of things. I'm personally not a great big fan of vision statements and, and priority and that, and that kind of, we spend time on that here. Um, from my personal perspective, if we had a better and deeper, potentially academically um, in-depth discussion about culture and how to, how to affect it, it may be something that we could help our army with. The next question I'm gonna ask to uh, Major Harrison, to you, sir. Um, should the Army consider integrating our PME with officers enlisted combined at ILE, War College, Captain's Career Course, et cetera? Should that's that be an option? That's a hard one. I'm gonna go to Sherdo first. Okay. She's, she's the one getting her PhD. Yeah. And <laughs> she has experience as a non-commissioned officer. This is perfect. And, and, and OCS and all that, yeah. <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts? Do you think so that's the, a so good idea? So is the idea. question um, integrating NCOs and officers for the entire nine months? Yes. Um, I necessarily don't agree with that only mm -hmm. because I, I feel as an NCO and an officer, how they're paired for SAR uh, commander, SAR major, battalion commander, it's a team. Yes. So although you should know the uh, qualifications, what each person should be doing, I think if you put them in school and combine, you may have a little bit of crossing boundaries or right. confusion. So if the command team is confused because maybe someone's trying to say, well, you didn't learn this or whatever. So now you're trying to do each other's job. And I think it purposely have an NCO and officer as a team parallel, not you may be nested on some ideas, but you have distinctly different roles. So if, if you are in school together, how would you teach individually those lanes to yeah. do their lines of efforts the way they're supposed to do at the expertise level? without crossing those boundaries. Now, can you implement some type of cumulative exercise or learning yeah. at the end or in the middle for asthma check? Yeah. I think that might be beneficial for the synergy yeah. that's gonna happen when they go to the field. But as far as trying to target focus on uh, expertise, yeah. I think it needs to be separate. Okay. Yeah, but I, I, would, I would totally agree with that. I mean, and I, again, I'll use a silly analogy to probably go sideways on me, but agree. Everything that, that Sherdo said and laid out perfectly but you know, it's like it's like most teams. I mean, you don't have the quarterbacks that you know do the same drills as the linemen on a football team, right? I mean, they, we, we're going to play together, we're going to operate together, we're going to execute together. But then there's certain drills you want quarterbacks doing, there's certain drills you want the linemen doing. Exactly. But it's how they come together. And and to this day, we do those things. I mean, even at we were at MCOE Fort Fort Benning, you know, a few weeks ago, and and those points where you, you find that synergy and you can stitch things together, like Sherdo pointed out. They're, they're there now. They exist now, and and nobody's preventing any of the courses, especially when you're at a center of excellence, and you have your non-commissioned officer courses, you have your officer courses, your warrant officers, where you can piece those things together to where they can see the synergy while they're in the institutional, you know, side of our army, and then they go back because again, different roles, responsibilities, everything else. They really need to see that, understand that, get comfortable with it, and then you put it into practice. I mean, that's where all the learning occurs. That's it. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time. So I'm going to leave the last question to you. Uh, where do we go from here? The point we, or the step we take from here is continue to do what we're doing right now. I mean, continue this dialogue because a lot of the, the answers are there. My only hope when we've started with, so in where I started, you know, with the article and, and looking at things that we were hearing, you know, at that point in time, I was hearing, is how do we get that you know truly inside the building to our army senior leaders? I mean, I'm, most people look at me and go, "You're a pre-star, you're army senior leader." Well, there's a level above that, right? To relook, I mean, our army staff at some of the things that we're doing policy-wise, things that we know we're doing that we just have to amplify better because a lot of those things, I think the army is doing, but everybody doesn't know. So now, how do we communicate better? Because we're we're doing that, but it it sounds like 
nobody really knows it or they understand what we're trying to do. And then some things do need to change based on what we're hearing because you'll never go wrong with listening to the organization and have the organization not tell you what the right answer is, but at least point you in the right direction. So I think that's what this, this dialogue, this conversation got us, which is for me personally and professionally is exactly where I wanted us to land is you've got to get all this on the table. These are out loud things that you talk about, not under the table, not sidebarred, so we can have the discussion, but also in hopes that those that are you know, at the levels that have the concerns or issues start to understand the other aspects of our enterprise too. It's just not a one-way communicate, hey, we're all screwed up, we're all jacked up. It's like, well, you gotta see other things. You gotta see how our enterprise really works then factor that into your discussion. It goes back to the, the whole reframe point, right? But to see the other side of it, so now you've, you've got a more balanced perspective and then make your decisions, make your judgments, you know, form your opinions, assumptions based on that. So unfortunately we're out of time, uh, but I wanna tell you in closing, I am, uh, I'm from South Carolina. I am truly uh, proud of your accomplishments and. Uh, hopefully, you'll give me another opportunity to sit down and talk to you about these important, important issues. So no, thank I wanna, you. I want to thank you, sir. Great. Right, and then thank the team. I appreciate yeah, the, team the team being up here as well. Well. So, very valuable mm -hmm. feedback. Thank you.